Dear Mom and Dad, we have 11 days left. We start marching tomorrow at 0500 for FTX. I can't wait. That's the last thing I have to do before becoming a soldier. I would describe Dan as one of the most sentimental, caring, considerate, generous, fun-loving boy. <laughs> I would describe Dan as um, full throttle. Dan had a true um, passion for going fast. Cars, motorcycles, skateboarding, snowboarding. Dan had no fear. That's what kind of scared me a little bit. He didn't have any fear of it. <laughs> he grew up at the racetrack with me, basically. He'd bring friends, but at the same time, all of a sudden he's over talking to one of the 70 year olds and them two are just sitting down talking. You know, and the next thing I know he's helping some other guy, he's crawling under the car with him to change transmissions. So he worked and could befriend all the different ages. School was difficult, you know, he gravitated more towards working with his hands and what he wanted to do in the future. He was already taking college courses in his junior and senior year. So he'd go to up to Century College to do auto body and things. So he, he was going in a, in, a, in a direction, but it, was, it wasn't quite as fast as he wanted to go at the time. I think he had aspirations of doing good things, great things, but didn't know how to go about it. The military was never on his mind. It wasn't like he grew up, always want to be an army guy, you know, and it wasn't anything like that. It was abrupt. One day he came home from work and went down to his room, kind of just got cleaned up, came upstairs and said to his dad and I, okay, well, I'm going to go meet my recruiter. We, you're going to go meet your what? And he kind of mumbled, I'm going to go meet my, my recruiter. You're what? <laughs> no, come back here. We have to have a conversation. You're going to go meet a recruiter? Yep, I'm going to go meet a recruiter. And that's how we learned that he decided on his own that he wanted to join the military. We had several talks, and the day his recruiter was at the house, I made sure and said, hey, you're signing up right now. Don't kid yourself. You will be deployed. You will end up over in Afghanistan or Iraq. So be prepared. Understand what you're signing. And he goes, yeah, I'm ready. He was ready to go. Basic training, it was rough at first. Then it started to change rapidly though. Actually, I went down to pick him up from basic and I picked up a different son. And when he came home, that boy stood so tall. The shoulders were back and he just had this sparkle in his eye and this joy, you could just see it. And I was convinced, yes, he now has found his way. It was the confidence. It was total different in the confidence era. And that just continued on through his time in the National Guard. Deployment. They actually deployed from the armory and then he was, he was gone. So training and then they deployed to overseas and he was stationed in Basra, Iraq. He, he wanted to go. He was not depressed about I get to go. He was actually more a little bit down in the mouth because he says, we have to escort the band around. <laughs> and he's just like, I don't want to escort a band around. It was one of his letters that he wrote back that told me what he's doing. He's got inner perimeter duty. Well, I was happy. You know, I thought, well, he's, he's inside. You know, he's, not, not much is gonna happen. So it got to be Father's Day. I'm kind of expecting a, a call. Well, Father's Day came and went and there was no call. 
And so I was kind of disappointed, you know? And then next day, a phone call woke me up and it was Dan. And he just says, Dad, I'm in Atlanta and I'm flying home. Can you pick me up to the airport in about four hours? When Dan came home on leave while he was deployed, we hardly saw him, which was great because he was gonna hang with his buddies, be with his friends, do as much as he could in the short period of time that he was home. And that was fine by us. That weekend that he's gonna be home, I was already headed to the racetrack. He got his car out and that was his day. And he raced the vehicle, did well that day, and we spent that whole weekend as something that he loved and I loved to do, we did it together. His last day home here was July 8th. The last night that he was with us, I hugged him goodbye and I said to him, piece of cake. He says, yep, mom, piece of cake. Because you've already been there and you've already, already shown yourself that you can do this. So it's just, it's just a piece of cake. Right now, three Minnesota families are dealing with the loss of a loved one killed in Iraq. Dan Drevnik, James Wirtish, and Carlos Wilcox died yesterday when a rocket hit their base near Basra. I was already up, I was already awake. But at five o'clock in the morning, the doorbell's ringing. I could tell right away by the look on Ken's face that something's up. And he just turned and looked at me and he goes, Something happened, or something, something happened, or I was, what are you talking about? And he opened up the door, and then there's those two men, dressed in their finest uniform. And right away, Ken started crying, because he knew. All three families, the doors were knocked on at 5 o'clock in the morning. And when I saw two Army soldiers dressed in their Class A's at the front door, I knew right away. First year, you're just in a, in a whirlwind and you're pulled in one direction and you're doing this and you're doing that and you have this event and that event and you're just pulled all over in one year. The second year, you're trying to pick up the pieces from that year that you just went through. What I say, I tell people, it was year three that it really sunk in. It became real. The hurt doesn't go away. It's just different. We just found our new normal. So, and now it's been, it will be 10 years come this July that since we lost him. We wanted to do something to remember Dan by. Something that would continue his name, continue his legacy, because we were proud of what he fulfilled in his life. Dan fulfilled probably 60 years of living in his 22 years of existence. So we wanted to continue that on. He wanted to be a state trooper. I was overjoyed myself because that's what I did for 30 years, I was a state trooper. And so for him to want to follow in my footsteps, per se, it was a great thing. The Dan Drevna Memorial Fund is a scholarship fund that gives scholarships to military men and women and their families who are going to school to be police officers or to go in a law enforcement program. We're proud of it. We hear great stories back. Three of Dan's unit are now state troopers. So that's proud. We see Dan is now the educator in his scholarships that we give away. He is now the educator for a kid who really didn't could care less about school. As of to date, we have given 112 scholarships and that's $1,000 a piece. And every time that we give one of those away is giving another piece of Dan out, another piece of Dan, another piece of Dan, and then he lives on through so many people. The year after Dan was killed, basically our neighbors 
got together. They decided that they were going to pay for a paver stone. And they asked for us to approve the writing. There's not a day that I, if I drive by in Woodbury that I go by the memorial and I think that, oh, this paver's right there. I know exactly where it's at. It turned out great. Having Dan's name engraved in the Woodbury Memorial, it, yeah, it, it means a lot. Because there's another place you can go to, you could see his name, and you could actually have a connection to it. And there again, he, he is placed amongst his brothers and sisters. I couldn't be more proud of him, and I just love him, and I have nothing but pride for him to make that decision on his own because he saw the direction he was going. You can't get more honorable than that. I know it brings joy to us. And there's tears at times, there's feelings at times. Your final thought, yeah, it was, it's hard. I'm sure glad I got to know him for 22 years.